So um, we're just going to pass around a, an artifact. I'll explain that in a minute. Okay, so um, let's see, it's 2015. So three years ago, or two and a half years ago, um, I was uh, meeting with uh, Bob Glushko, who's an pro uh, adjunct professor at uh, UC Berkeley, and he, was he, had, he had been working on a, putting together a book for the past three years. He had gathered all his notes, he was ready to get going, he had several chapters together, and he showed me one of them. And um, being, being an editor, being an, an author and an editor for many years, I looked at it and sat down with a pen and started editing. I handed it to him in the morning. And he said, wow, that's great. Would you like to be my editor? And I said, yeah, but only if I get to do it my way. If I'm going to produce a book, I'm going to produce a real book. I'm not going to produce something that's, you know, well, most of the books that you see on the market today. I want to, I want to do it right. And he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, we've got to have an index, for example. We've got to have a proper bibliography. We've got to, you know, we've got to do a proper glossary, et cetera. So he agreed. And... Um, and we got started. So his book, The Discipline of Organizing, um, covers a lot of territory. He had, been, he had been teaching these courses at UC Berkeley for several years and had all his notes together. And, and he discovered in trying to put this book together that um, wanting to have a broad textbook that was also deep it was really hard to read. There's just too much information on every page, and you got diverted into different places. So he thought, OK, the, the thing that we should do is, um, is break it up a little bit. Um, sorry, I'm going to step aside for a second here. So the, the principal conceit of this book is that, that there's a thing called an organizing system. And it's, his definition is an intentionally arranged collection of resources and the interactions they support. And I thought about that for a while, and I thought, well, a book's the same thing. So we have an intentional arrangement. We have a well-understood collection of what a, what a book is. And this arrangement actually manifests itself in a couple of places that are familiar to, us, to most of us in publishing. And that's the Chicago Manual Style and Doc Book. And it's interesting that Doc Book was, in part, informed by the Chicago Manual Style. Not much, because the principal author of, of Doc Book um, at the time, um, actually said that the Chicago Manual Style was deprecated. But in spite of that, we managed to, to, um, to get most of the elements of what Chicago Manual Style thought that a book was into Doc Book. So in approaching this, um, producing this book, the first thing we had to think about was how are we going to mark it up? The, the text had been written in Word. Um, I'm going to diverge quite a bit from the paper, by the way. So the, the paper's interesting. Read the paper. Have fun with it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my own thing here. So we looked at what kind of markup we wanted to use and what our targets were going to be. And our first target was this artifact that's being passed around right now. And I, I call it an artifact because we actually made a conscious decision at, at, uh, at one point in the process that we were only going to produce one print edition of the book, that we needed to leave behind a manifestation of the book as a print artifact, and then we were going to move on. That decision is being revisited at the moment, but that was our decision at the time. So we, we knew that we had to produce a book, and we also knew that we had to start producing EPUBs. So initially, we thought we were going to use DITA. In fact, we thought so, so strongly that I spent um, quite a bit of time with Elliot Kimber figuring out how I was going to use DITA because I wasn't, wasn't all that familiar with it. Um, and then something happened. Bob Glushko ran into Tim O'Reilly at a publishing conference and they got talking and Tim O'Reilly told Bob about their new Atlas system, single source publishing, could produce a book, could produce an EPUB, could produce a Mobi. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to take the easy route. There's something available for us to do. We don't have to um, bogged down Elliot's time because Elliot was going to be our production guy on, on that. And um, why did that happen? Oh. Anyway, so we ended up with DocBook. 
And that was good for me because I'm more familiar with DocBook than I am with Dita. And we knew our targets were XHTML5 and at the time EPUB2 because that's all we had to work with. We then moved on to doing EPUB3 in the second edition and now we're looking at um, using EPUB 3.1 in the next edition and hopefully DocBook 5.1 and I'll explain why a little bit later. Um, but we're really waiting on DocBook 5.1 and of course now we've got it up to the XHTML5 rec. So the book is designed with a core body of content and lots of endnotes. This is how we separated out all the disciplinary content, well maybe not all of it but a lot of the disciplinary content so that you could actually read the content and then skip to the footnotes as you needed to. So, we factored out the content. This is one of Bob's little graphics, just to explain that we've, you know, you've got your core material, you've got your tagged end notes, and we've also tagged some sidebars, paragraphs, examples, etc., to be, to be disciplinary. So, we produced our first book. That's the thing that's passing around right now. Um, it came with an EPUB, we produced an EPUB 2 edition at the same time and a MOBI to go along with it. And we used the Atlas system to do that. And so, in the book, the footnotes are tagged, are, you know, the footnotes are footnotes. The representation in the book is as you'd normally see a footnote, just a little number. And then when you go to the end notes, you actually get to see what discipline does this relate to? You know, computing, cog sci, LIS, LIS being library and information science, uh, cog sci being cognitive science. So, so here's the breakup, breakdown, or at least this is now the breakdown, uh, although we've added a couple since then. So last year, we produced two new editions, a core concepts edition, no endnotes, none of the disciplinary content, and a professional edition, all of it. So then we get something a little bit better with our endnotes. What we want, you know, we want the students to be able to look at, to read the text and have some clue because there's some effort involved in following a footnote, right? In print, you have to flip to a, the end of the chapter. In, in hypertext, you have to go and look at the footnote and come back to it. iBooks gave us this little pop-up, which is nice enough, except for one thing. Um, links don't work inside of here. So that citation to, to uh, that citation to Tim, if you click on it, you're not going to get to the bibliography. This is a, this is a problem with iBooks. But it, it's, it's something anyway, you know, you get, you get a little bit of a hypertext cue and see what you're doing. So we had to, um, we had to customize our build environment um, when, we, when we wanted to produce the, the EPUB 3 books. Atlas wasn't keeping up with us. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't prepared to move forward on DocBook and we wanted some of the features of DocBook 5. Um, and they weren't, there, there were just a number of things that we wanted to do that, that Atlas wasn't going to support. And because we had worked from the beginning with Bob Staten um, as our um, customization, doing our customizations in the, in the Atlas system, we just asked them to move everything out of there and build us a whole new build environment and, and move forward using DocBook 5. Um, in producing the print book and in producing the original EPUBs, uh, we had the able assistance of Nellie McKesson and Adam Whitwer, who uh, were with O'Reilly at the time, and uh, as I mentioned, Bob, Bob Staten, and uh, some scripting that was done by Alex. So, so here's a footnote, right? And you can see that um, I, I've made some of the markup yellow. So you can see a footnote starts up on the second line there. Its audience is web. It has an ID, it has a label, and then the paragraph also specifies its audience. Um, we, we happen to have the audience attribute available to us, so we just turned it to our purpose and uh, used that to identify the, uh, the disciplines. So we can produce static multivalent editions. And that was our sort of next step. Right? We want... This guy's going to keep coming up, eh? 
So the, the static multivalent additions are, um, are designed by setting a number of parameters, and our user level and the, the disciplines that we want to include. And so we can mix and match. It's guided by a configuration file that lists all the categories and defines some groups. So the first step in the build is doing consolidation and profiling. So we, we take all the files together, we run X include, we get everything sorted out, and we profile it. By profiling, I mean we just exclude a lot of content. For example, in the core contents edition, uh, core concepts edition, we exclude plenary notes. But I'll get on to, to doing the more specific editions in a moment. So here's a configuration. I don't know if you can read. Can you read that, Norm? Yeah. Okay. So we, we specify, we, we use the term category as opposed to discipline, but you get the idea. So you've got a set of disciplines, core, LIS, museums, archives, etc. Okay, we configure some user levels. So that, you know, the top of the user tree is editor. That's me and Bob. And then you've got the professional, instructor, graduate, undergraduate, and novice. We also configure a set of professions. And this was just a, a little trick. Yes? No? OK. Uh, this was a little, little trick I had to do in order to make some things work. But basically, it gave us a way to, to identify some content that is specific to um, a particular interest group. So here's, here's the groups for, for example, the professional edition and the core concepts edition. And you can see that the professional edition lists a bunch of um, um, disciplines. It also references professional. And the core concepts is undergrad and only the core content. So in order to produce a memory institution's configuration, we only include library science, museums, and archives. We exclude all the others. So here, for example, are a bunch of groupings for our academic editions. So we've got a memory institution's edition, an informatics edition and a sense-making edition. Sense-making edition is cognitive science, linguistics, and philosophy. So we can mix and match. Other editions that we're working on, uh, an instructor edition, a novice edition. We've, we're, we're starting to think now about platform-specific editions because we're encountering differences in the behavior of, of different readers. So we're starting to think about how we're going to deal with that. Um, we're also looking at school-specific editions. So we're Actually, th this, this book is now in about 50 schools worldwide. And we're soliciting content from the instructors. We want them to be able to put their own content into the book and to produce edition that is specific to their school or to their course. Um, we're currently working on, well, there's a, um, Bob has some students working on this, the parameters for our accessible editions. Um, we've got our editor's edition and the dynamic polyvalent edition. So the dynamic polyvalent edition, next step, we move beyond the static editions, includes the core and all the supplemental content. It can be profiled at the user level, by school, by device, by, uh, again, by user level, and it has uh, interactive design select, uh, sorry, discipline selection. So here's an example of the bibliography. I use this because it's, it's, the, it's the quickest and easiest way to show how this works. Um, so when we look at the bibliography, in this case, we're looking at only LIS, museum, and archive entries. And, and of course, the core always comes in. Okay, so all, there's, there's the bibliography when you look at it that way. But when I make a different set of selections, I still get able at the beginning, because it's core, but now all of these other entries our Cogsaw in philosophy. Let me just go back and show you that. So we can see Scott Abel down at the bottom there. And any other core? No, no other core in there. OK? All right, so I mentioned earlier our definition of an organizing system, interactions they support. So in this book, we've included some, um, a key points section. You'll see it in the physical manifestation that at the end of most chapters, there's a list of key points, just a summary of what you should have learned when you read this chapter. When we produced the um, EPUB 3 edition, we added the ability. To 
actually Alex worked on this, um, we added the, the capability of turning those key points into a quiz. And I'll show you that in, in a couple of minutes. We have, some, uh, we have the experimental content customization that what I just showed you, selecting, selecting the different values. As, as Alex said earlier, he's not a UI designer, neither am I. So we're experimenting at this stage. Um, some supplemental content visualization tricks, and, um, and I just want to make some comments on the EPUB 3 readers. So in the key points, so for example, chapter 2, in print, um, in print or in EPUB, you start, it start out, starts out looking like this, right? Here's a set of key points. There's references back to where we found these originally. Press a button, and it turns into this. So the questions are hidden in the first case, but then they're shown in the second case. And it's, it's, uh, it's not shown like exactly like this because you get a question and then you get an answer, but I'll show it to you in a moment. Here's the markup for that. So we simply have a Q&A Q &A set whose role is a quiz, and the scripts take care of the rest. So now, so now we're working on um, visualization and interaction. And so we want, to sh we, want, um, we want to give the readers some idea of what the heck they're looking at and where the supplemental content is and what kind of supplemental content there is. So this shows an example of, in each chapter, you know, how many footnotes do we have? And we can see that in chapter five, there's not an awful lot. And chapter, eight ha chapter four and eight have an awful lot of footnotes. So now here, and, and this demo, by the way, I can only show you on slides because I don't have a, a working demo of this. So if I roll over chapter four, it shows me the breakdown of the footnotes. And now I can select LIS and say, yes, I want to see LIS footnotes. That's a little bit better user interface than the one I showed you earlier. Content added. And then we're looking at stuff like this, where we can tag um, individual paragraphs. So roll over, fade it out, slide it up, move on. We're also experimenting with, um, I guess I'm experimenting with, this, this, this wasn't one of Bob's favorite things for me to do, but I, I had fun doing it. Um, and I'll, I'll take you, you know, there, there's all these different discourse types, but here's my favorite, because this has the most, effect for, most useful effect to me. So parenthetical cross-references. There's hundreds of cross-references in, in the book, right? A, a good textbook should have lots of cross-references. But they get in the way. I mean. You know, if you really just want to scan through a book, if you're looking at, want to just get through it and not have all these distractions, it'd be nice to be able to hide them. And I'm going to show you how I can do that later. But anyway, we just identify them as parenthetical notes. And, and um, I've, I, we've also identified um, a lot of editorial comments that I just found were getting in the way of reading. All right, so now I want to talk about EPUB 3 readers for a second. So um, presentation controls. Um, they're very limited in most readers. You know, you can change the font. You can change it from single column to two column and vice versa. Um, the search capabilities are, well, primitive as far as I'm concerned. And, and I, I'm coming from the perspective of, you know, back in 1996, 95, I guess, um, I, I was product manager for um, a, an SGML tool called Panorama. And in Panorama, I was able to do contextual searches. You know, I could, I could search on a name as, you know, a, a person's name. Or I could search on something that was an object or a thing or, you know, depending on how I marked it up because, because Panorama was sensitive to what all the elements were and w would allow me to do that. Well, today's tools don't let me do that. I just get a list in, in, in order. So better search tools in, in EPUBs would be, I have two minutes? OK. Um, uh, hypertext and queues are an issue. Um, they, they, they behave all differently. Tables of contents and other navigational features in the ebook readers are inconsistent. Um, most of the ebook readers don't recognize footnotes, don't do anything special with them. Um, 
they have no sense of citations and bibliography or de relationship between uh, definitions and the glossary. You know, it'd be nice if, and when I hovered over a word and I was offered a definition, it would actually offer me my, the definition from my glossary as opposed to from Google. Uh, and indexes, and I'm, I'm not going to get all these examples done, but anyway. So here's, here's a, an example, uh, hypertext Q. So in, in most things, you know, you've got to click on a link and go. This, so if I hovered, hovered over number 583, I get this Q. And it gives me some clue about what's on the other end of that link. Do I want to traverse this? And which was sort of our goal in, in putting up, you know, putting these, these, these um, markers on the footnotes to tell you well, what discipline it is to give you a clue whether you wanted to follow it. This, is, this gives you an even better clue. Right? I, I now know what's at, the, or at least part of what's at the other end of this link and can decide whether I want to take the time to go forward and backward. So demo, we're not going to get much time for this, but we're going to do it. Whoops. Okay, so I need my glasses. Here, for, here we go. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. See, so, so this is iBooks, and I get this little pop-up, which is helpful, but as I said, if I, if I click on that, I'm not going anywhere, okay? Doesn't help me at all. You know, I want to go to here, and this is the one that I like. This is Lucifox, and in Lucifox, if I hover over a footnote, I get something useful. Also, I'd like to observe that, you know, this is, this is a very complete table of contents, but it's really hard to, you know, do that. And so, and that's okay, but it doesn't expand. And what I haven't got here, where's the one that expands? Well, I'm not going to have enough time to do this. So, the, so a table of con so you know, I've been a technical writer since 1977. That's my main thing. And the only reason I ever got involved with markup was in order to accomplish producing books, mostly. And I'd like to produce better books. And I wish that EPUB readers um, would do better and smarter things and more consistently. And the table of contents should be collapsible. We know how to do this, and they, they should, you know, they should all do this. Um, they should all understand what things are, are um, definitions and how they're related to the glossary. There should just be an understanding of this. And, I, and this, these kind of semantics are in EPUB 3 and in EduPub, but they're just not uh, being propagated out to the readers. So I think my time, am I done? Okay. So I didn't cover everything I wanted to cover, but there you have it. Thank you very much for your time.